Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on art and oral literature. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to announce, uh, to introduce our chairperson, Dr. Yalav J.P. Waters. He's a social anthropologist and lectures at Royal Thimphu College, Bhutan. Prior to joining Royal Thimphu College, he taught in Sikkim Central University and Eberhard Karls University in Tübingen, Germany. He's the author of In the Shadows of Naga Insurgency, Tribes, State and Violence in Northeast India, Nagas as a Society Against Voting and Other Essays, and um, the co-editor also of Nagas in the 21st Century and Democracy in Nagaland, Traditions, Tribes, Tensions, both published by Highlander Books. Uh, on a personal level, it's such a pleasure to meet you, even if online. And I think most Naga scholars are quite familiar with Dr. Waters' work. Um, and so it'll be wonderful today to hear what you have to say. Our Speakers for this session are Dr. Atiko Kaiser from Jamia Millia Islamia University, uh, Sengang Lu Taime, Assistant Professor, Miranda House University, Zachano Zed Yantan, Research Scholar, TIS Mumbai, Ngarin Singlai, PhD Scholar, National Museum Institute of History of Art, Conservation and Museology, Delhi. With this brief introduction, I would like to hand over the time to the chairperson. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kedice. I hope I'm, I'm audible. Um, I would like to start by thanking um, um, NSA for um, organizing this and for inviting me to, to be here. I'm very honored to be able to share this, this session. Um, what I understand is that every speaker has 10 to 15 minutes um, and that we have the four presentations uh, first, after which we will have some time for uh, Q&A. So I think we should not lose any, any precious time, especially in view of the very exciting titles and the very um, promising presentations that, that we have in this session. So I would like to um, invite Dr. Uh, Atiko Kaiser to uh, present the paper. <clears throat> Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, respected chairperson, Dr. Dupi Walter, co-presenters, session organizer, viewers. Good evening, or I should say good afternoon to one and all. I'll begin with the session Art and Oral Literature. The topic of my presentation is performing arts and communication, globalization, cultural resurgence, and war. Although imagining alternative globalization has been doing the round, which some consider that the ongoing pandemic has affected capitalism, the face of the globalization, popular opinion is of the view that it is just another face of capitalism. The issue of vaccine nationalism has further substantiated to such claim. In the midst of global crisis, it is premature to think that globalization will come to a halt. Given such a reality at hand, the preparedness to face the onslaught of globalization will define our status before reducing ourselves to consumer, which perhaps we are already. In the wake of globalization and globalization of Indian economy, steadily, the Naga society is first turning into a consumer society, and evidently, the gap between the rich and the poor is getting wider, irrespective of whatever positive impact it may have. Within the sea of possibilities and challenges, the paper intends to focus on performing arts, which is not 
only just tool of cultural expression and manifestation of identity, but also can be source of war. In narrow understanding and in economic sense, those activities that are paid are considered as work. Therefore, work is measure in terms of money. And anything that is expressed, narrated, and portrayed artistically and artistically can be considered as an art. Art forms can be categorized into performing arts, media arts, visual arts, and literary arts, though it may not be exhausting, since some include design and architecture, also in its form, although it may be possible to include within visual arts. If we consider painting, sketching, sculpture, design, architecture, weapon, and basketry, among other as visual arts, then singing, dancing, acting, storytelling, poetry recitation, theater, music, symphony, opera, judge, etc. constitute performing arts. In keeping the traditional performing arts as considered to just suppose with creative arts, although such dichotomy is getting narrower, our lender described visual arts can be understood as an extension of fine arts. Whereas the term performing arts is an umbrella concept used to cover various fields. Therefore, the conceptual understanding of Performing art is vast, and the present paper will limit its scope to folk dance, folk song, folk music, fusion, relation, and various other genres that blend with traditional costume, attire, and dress. In traditional like society, performing arts are commonly associated with community festivals that occur almost every season as part of the requirement of agriculture activity since Nagas are basically agriculturists. Traditional ceremonies such as pulling of stones, creation of monolites, erosion of monolites, construction of cranes during fish of marriage, history, construction of house, in times of mutual constructing and leavening of territory, mutual activities of agriculture work and even in time of war, which have now become part of the festivals such as Ondil, Lungaini, and various other respective tribe community festivals. Besides songs, dance, and music, there are various other genres which are part of our activities during festivals and sermons. Those various art practices are now becoming thing of the past in the wake of social change and Christianity in particular, some form of cultural expression are still noticeable while giving the sense of continuity and change. For easy understanding, performing arts in this paper is divided into expression through music, expression through action, and expression to song. Music. Music neither belongs to the external world as described by the physics, nor the inner world of psychology. Music is the thought brain, neither here nor there. Music as a medium of communication has long history and music is used in diverse occasions to define the context of the moon. Indeed, it is universally accepted that music connects people emotionally better than any other modes of communication. For the Naga society, folk songs are substantial contributing factor 
in the construction of identity and belongings. Besides folk song and dance, our medium of cultural transformation, they are the store of, of knowledge and wisdom. In the void of texts and written record, travel history, tradition, skill and art are preserved in the form of song and dance. Expression through action. Among others, expression by action will include folk dance, play drama, artistic form of write and music. Besides folk song, folk dance is an effective oral medium, not only that define the Naga ethnic identity, but also communicate the course of its history. The third one, expression through sound. Sound as communication is nothing new and has been practiced widely across culture in various ways. There's a general assumption that language developed out of sound as human society progresses and sound continue to play a significant role in human communication. The importance of sound communication continues to grow, such as people honking, trains popping, plane drawing, television, boozing, etc. Different genres of sounds carry different meaning based on context and situation. Sounds signify and symbolize some sort of morals and socialness, for instance. To hear stand for to understand, to act or to obey. Within the manner of song or phonetic expression in the Nasra in the Naga society, it can be include various genres, ululation in indigenous, makke, fuller in indigenous, mobo, horn blowing in indigenous, kebukoho, etc. Evidently, every action and activity of the Naga is accompanied with such certain genres of sound, be it during agricultural activity, while carrying heavy law, during time of pulling for monolith, or as I noted, even during time of war. So performing art, if you see today, is a cultural embodiment. Performing art makes alive the tradition of the past while contextualizing in the present context to strengthen the common heritage in the midst of first digital and globalized world we continue to cherish the moment that we witness folk songs folk dances classical music with traditional tunes instrumentals flute since they are part of our identity and culture with its ageless significance, the performing arts are an important part of our life, our communication, and our self-expression. Now to come to the second part of my presentation, how to make this performing art as profession, as career, as work. To begin with, institutionalization, intellectual property, right and work. Performing arts are labor intensive and time consuming activities, but hardly treated as work since such performance remain largely within the realm of showcasing, merrymaking, and entertainment rather than profession. Since we are yet to develop folk song, folk dance, traditional music, and various genres as part of work, through institutionalizing them with adequate protection of intellectual property rights, incentive and returns that the localities receive is major. The amount of time and energy that the artists have invested are far more as compared to incentive and the, risk and the returns that they receive. They have been exploited and misused in various ways to meet narrow objective and immediate goals. Since the talent, skill, and expertise of the artists are not protected with IPR, 
while institutionalizing with adequate means for exploitation, misusing and copying, it is considered a more of free service. Cultural entrepreneurship. Cultural entrepreneurship through harnessing the steel talent heritage of the local will not only help to face the challenge of the onslaught of globalization by becoming a contributor, but also can strengthen cultural identity while advocating distinct cultural heritage. The potential for gainful employment in such an endeavor needs to pay adequate attention, which are often ignored by the policy makers. It requires serious effort and innovative thinking rather than piecemeal approach and often looking with narrow perspective as more of shopping and for entertainment. To make the cultural sector marketable and saleable, it requires adequate attention while giving a serious thought of how to move forward from traditional approaches to a more dynamic and modern touch. Lack of market to sell cultural goods and services remain a major obstacle for artists to think of making them a profession and career. To make such a dream economically viable and market oriented, there is an urgent need of how to pack cultural goods as per national and international standards. Among others, due to lack of concrete policy direction, Cultural sectors remain largely untapped. It is important to modernize while providing market linkage through adequate infrastructural activities in order to encourage cultural entrepreneurship for gainful employment. Third, documentation and translation. Another serious concern is that no serious effort has been given to document and translate the cultural sector since most of them are still exist in an oral form or as part of social and cultural memory. Documentation and translation will not only improve the scope of market value as part of economic venture, but also can develop and adapt with the pace of time. Labeling and branding. Labeling and branding of performing arts will center on the issue of copyright, intellectual property, trade agreement, and a host of other issues raised by technological development and consolidation within the entertainment and communication industry. Strong Western influence has resulted a lack of confidence to cultural heritage. In this regard, Building link in collaboration with intellectual property organizations and other related organizations in the field through government initiatives will go a long way to safeguard the local artists and encourage them to develop them as well. Equally, both the government and civil society can actively engage in creating awareness on necessity and importance of intellectual property rights for the security of the protect for the security and protection of the local artists or indigenous artists. In conclusion, cultural diplomacy, what Joseph Mee called slow information that includes among other arts, as compared to first information media of radio, movies, and news will need to emphasize with systematic attention. Digitalization of our performing arts, rich cultural heritage, remain a big challenge. Korean experience shows how Alua or Korean wave is becoming a strong soft power diplomatic relation as well as economy opportunity. Promotion of folk song and different traditional tunes blend with modernity can deepen the northern identity which can be digitalized for larger audience. It will not be easy for the Nagas to become world artists by limiting the Western, but to become famous folk artists is not possible. It's not impossible and very much within our reach. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Kaise. This was, uh, I think, very, very, um, uh, very interesting and, and, and very broad perspective that you offered. Um, if you permit me, and I would like to ask one question before we before we continue to the next presentation. Um, in your assessment, um, you talk about the need to both modernize as well as bring into the marketplace um, performative arts in, in Nagaland uh, or among the Naga, sorry. Um, so my question is, how would you see the tension between doing so, between making a cultural resource and the kind of traditional intrinsic values that was associated with the, perform the performing arts among the Naga? Dr. Kaise, I think you have to unmute. Yeah, uh, I do agree that it's a big challenge and I'm sure uh, the debate continues whether it should be commercialized or it should be remain as uh, what they call uh, uh, community resource. Many a time, when you talk about this performing arts, I think there is no authorship. So this is one of the major problems, who own, who will own, who will own the ownership, whether this particular owned by the artist, the individual, or the cultural troops, or the or folk singer, or ultimately it will be owned up by a particular tribe like Sema, or like Chakasan, or like Mao. So this is how, like, uh, this is one of the major uh, controversy when it comes to oral literature. As oral literature is very much a part of our everyday experience, what uh, Walter uh, Ong would say is that a life war. So it is considered as everyday property. So this is one of the major issues. But I think, uh, if at all, we want to make this as a, a saleable, marketable item, we need to involve uh, our customary law in such a way that it is applicable uh, in the age of globalization and a contemporary time. Am I, I don't know whether I have answered your Thank question. you. Yes, yes, I think this is um, uh, a very important point to take away, this tension between commercializing or bringing culture in the marketplace, right? Which is perhaps to some extent um, important for it to survive versus the question of uh, who owns um, oral literature, who owns um, uh, traditional kind of resources. Maybe we can come back to, to this uh, further on uh, in the discussion. For the moment, I would like to thank, to thank Dr. Kaise for this very wonderful presentation. And I would now like to ask uh, Dr. Sengungu uh, Tamai to uh, take her time out. <clears throat> uh, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and also the, my co-presenter and organizer for giving me this opportunity. Uh, the title of my, I'm just going to dive in and just read out from my paper. Um, the title of my uh, paper is called New Approach to Classification of Wrongway Folk folk songs. So on being asked uh, why the seed sowing songs have the theme of romantic love during my field work in Noni district in Manipur in 2015, an informant said he was not sure, uh, but perhaps to sustain the interests of the able-bodied youth who labor in the field through flirtation, or perhaps uh, to be able to relate to the universal emotion of love. It was obviously a question he didn't anticipate, nor has he speculated on the thematic aspect of the song sung in the field labor. The informant happens to be, uh, coincidentally, the author of an undated book uh, called Zeleng Rong Min Lu Ramko on the songs of the Zeleng Rong, an essay of, on the folk songs of the wrong way. The 80-page uh, booklet mainly focuses on the classification of the songs according to their traditional usages. This ambiguity in terms of the connection between the meaning of the songs and the labor echoes uh, John, Saul's, uh, John Shaw's Cape Breton experience when, where his informant stated when asked why they sing. 
the informant says, singing songs. Why? I don't know. People have been singing songs since the world began. Um, end quote. Uh, Shaw maintains that the singer regard it as a non-question as to what was the intention of the singing. Likewise, it was common to find Rome uh, to tradition bearers not being speculative about their musical activities or what the lyrics of the song intend, intended to achieve. The exercise of classification of folk songs, how they are defined or mutual relationship between them are lesser a concern than identifying the uses of these folk songs. Ellen Miriam and in Anthropology of Music 1964 uh, suggests two ways of understanding musical activities in a given culture. That is the uses and functions of music. By music, he refers to, I quote, the ways in which uh, music is employed in human society to the habitual practice of customary exercise of music, either as a thing in itself or in conjunction with others' activities, end quote. In other words, music could be understood in terms of how it is used in daily life, the context in which it, is, it traditionally occurs and in relation to other activities in the re respective culture. Functions, on the other hand, refers to the reason for the employment of music by assessing through analytical evaluation. In contrast to the utility of music, how music is consciously used for a purpose by the community, the functionality of music is concerned with the meaning of the music, what they feel about the music, about the songs, and what it tells uh, of their life together. Miriam succinctly explains that function, I quote, refers to the understanding of what music does to human beings as evaluated by outside observer who seeks to increase his range of comprehension, end quote. Drawing from Miriam's um, differentiation between uses and functions of music, it could be observed that the informants of um, and authors of Romwe folk songs collect collection solely emphasizes on the uses rather than the functions of music. The functional concepts could possibly be an academic analytical or academic analysis, analysis or revaluation affected by outsider, outside observer, but within the community, it is often not consciously articulated. Even so, a sweeping supposition that the wrong way speakers uh, maintain the accurate uses of their folk songs uh, would be somewhat superficial, given the fact that several of the folk songs collectors and singers no longer live in isolated traditional community. The gradual transformation of wrong way society has to be more accurately, more uh, carefully deliberated, especially with the decline of traditional work in urban spaces, and I'm talking about mostly in urban spaces, that the active practitioners of these songs currently live. For instance, despite claims of authenticity, agriculture themed folk songs have become seemingly living tradition that are, um, that are primarily enjoyed through the media. A large number of wrong way folk singers, especially those living in Infal Valley and in urban spaces, no longer use the songs in the theme, uh, songs on, on the theme of agriculture on, uh, for their original purpose. On the other hand, uh, the sections of wrong way speakers who still live in agrarian setup are mostly Baptist Christians. And many of the folk songs that are uh, recorded in the media have minimal significance in the lived culture. Moreover, the social changes uh, seen in the more recent times have influenced the way the continuity of these songs are, uh, is maintained. Folk songs began to appear in radio and recordings from the 1980s onwards, produced uh, primarily by local groups and in uh, professional recording studios. These songs are often produced with technologically aided embellishment to increase their aesthetics value, aesthetic value. Therefore, the classification of the folk songs according to their uses or any insights regarding them to a large extent are based on recollection rather than direct experience. It becomes important then to study the folk songs beyond what the earlier generation had understood these songs to be. In other words, the legacy of these songs can be examined beyond the way they have been traditionally classified. In fact, it is perhaps possible to find a new approach to study these songs based on how they continue to exist and what role they play in the life of the community. 
This paper examines the Rongwei folk songs based on basic empirical discoveries made during the fieldwork in Tamenglong, None, and in fall districts of Manipur. The first uh, part I would briefly talk about the categories, uh, you know, uh, categories of songs uh, according to the authors of folklore and their description of their usages. At the second section, I propose um, an alternative perspective to study the songs according to the community's perception, perception of what uh, some selected subgenres of folk songs meant in their relatively evolved social reality. In other words, it is an attempt to evaluate the relevance and functions of the folk songs in a community that no longer live in a cultural isolation. Uh, it briefly, the paper briefly examines what role of some of these songs play among the urban dwellers whose perception are more, uh, are more often than not um, mediated and influenced by dominant cultures surrounding them. So folk songs, uh, folk song or the genre of folk song is most anthologized uh, genre of Romwe folklore in print owing to the widespread practice and numerous variations. Um, there are about 30 identifiable subgenres and and uh, while uh, the authors or collectors of these um, folk songs compiled song samples under individual categories, which run up to about 35, uh, 40 subgenres uh, across many, many books they have authored. Uh, however, in all the cases, as commonly seen in anthologies of uh, rock folklore, folklore, there, there are primarily two features found in the author's introduction or, uh, to the collection. A, the urgency to preserve the songs that are fast disappearing, and B, the authors learned the songs from elders of the previous generation who, unlike themselves, them, themselves uh, lived a rural agrarian life. Uh, that doesn't mean that there are no authors who were sing, who were collecting the songs that they are singing in their lived culture, lived experience as well. Uh, gathering from both oral and print sources, the following terms that there are terms that I don't want to, you know, because we are given just 15 minutes, I'm just going to just briefly say that the songs comprises of, you know, from cradle to grave, from the time of the song of fertility to uh, the song that is sung when the newborn came, uh, and to uh, songs of lamentation and funeral, uh, and everything in between the festivities, uh, the, uh, the songs of labor, uh, and such like. So there are about 30, 35 to 40 shop subcategories within that. So I'm not going to go down to that. That's uh, a chapter in my PhD. Um, but um, just to give a contemporary context or, and some examples is that uh, from subgenres given uh, about 30 to 35 to 40 of them, um, field work, uh, no informant among the, in the field work, I came across that no informant claims to have authority or namdaulu or the song of new settlement. Rather, these songs are found in fiction and in, um, in novels and in other creative writing where a character sings that song and it, it's no longer practiced in any way because there are no new settlement. There is no work that is uh, uh, happening, you know, cutting down the, the huge trees and clearing it, uh, clearing a forest and settling, uh, setting up a new, new village. So these, are, these kind of songs are found in fiction and creative writing. And um, also uh, some other songs that, like, such as Munji uh, uh, a tradition of anonymous admirer living, uh, leaving flowers for a woman on the day of Lukia, meaning competition between boys and girls in the dormitory. The, such songs are no longer practiced, rather it is found in these anthologies only. And um, a lot of uh, the songs of labor, especially songs of pounding rice, uh, is seen among uh, practice among uh, many uh, villages in Tawal district of Manipur and Bishanpur area, but they are mostly sung again uh, or performed by women folks who no longer use pestle and mortar in their real life. And if, for instance, in Ragailong village in Infal is uh, the Pansaulu or the song of pounding rice was uh, practiced by women. They they, they learn from a coach and then they go record uh, in the All India Radio Infal uh, station where there is a 15 minute slot of wrong way or Kabul language. Um, 
and as, and examples like this uh, abundant and I'm not going to go down into uh, many details of it. Another very interesting fact is that the new sect of uh, traditional religious group called Tinkara Gong Chapriyak, they have cultural forums and they have cultural events where children uh, are, there are children camp and youth camp where these songs are taught instead, uh, these songs of labor are taught for to the people who are not laboring in the agricultural uh, setup anymore. So, um, so what is uh, considering the above findings, a student of Rongwei folk songs inevitably encounter with questions regarding in regards to the nature of existence of some of the some of these subgenres. Could the taxonomy uh, constructed much earlier, based on description of specific physical activity? be merely mnemonic in purpose, given that the relation between the activity and the song no longer correspond, or do these fossilized categories of a folk song deter from opening up a subgenres as subject of to study in a new way to evaluate the song? Miriam's conce uh, conception of the uses of music as the song's employment in daily life and defining them according to their habitual practice is probably no longer re relevant to some of these thriving folk songs in alternative settings. However, the functions within the uh, community could perhaps be evaluated in terms of how the songs continue to exist or not exist. Um, the, the method of collection through print or digital recording, especially of folk songs that are sung by singers who practically have little or nothing to do with the original usages, leave a little room for difference between the insider and outside observers. However, the bearers of these songs vastly differ from the one who taught the singer who in turn were taught by those who lived completely different lives at different period in history. Uh, one way to evaluate the functions of folk songs is to present a new method of classification. And that is my paper about um, uh, the, instead of descriptive nature of the terms, they could be divided according to the functions of the term of what music does to the community. To classify Rongwei folk song based on functionality of this music or the reason uh, music is employed in their community, one can borrow uh, Virginia Blankenhorn's uh, term of classifying Gaelic songs, the introversion and extroversion uh, characteristic. In, the, in introversion, the author means the emotional aspect pertaining to the activity of singing, the song that seek to establish, the song that I quote, seek to establish an intimate emotional connect with the listener, end quote. By, con by contrast, songs of um, extroversion uh, seek the appreciation and invite participation from the audience. The premise of singing these songs in the, in the collaboration between the singers and the crowd, be it, particip be it participation in refrain, sung in chorus or drawing comments and conversation around the story being narrated in the song. Among the wrong way songs, the most apt example of introversion would be Ram Lolo at the generic uh, category of confession of subjective emotion, mainly of sentimental love surrounding the theme of loss and separation. However, motif drawn from the classic tale of betrayal, such as the great beauty Gwilenai and Geremdang, where Gwilenai married another man while Geremdang was away to find a new land, are not confined to Ramlulu alone. Songs of labor, such as the song of rice pounding, songs of planting saplings, songs of weeding, have contents that are replete with emotion of fear, of loss, of loved one, and memories of erstwhile lovers, etc. A song of pounding, uh, rice pounding, often speaks of singer's desire and longing for somebody who is called by his or her uh, pseudonym. Uh, the songs of lamentation sung as funeral dirges are expression of deep anguish at the death of a friend. There are elegies in doleful tune uh, intended to affect the listeners emotionally. Uh, songs sung while traveling, Gilongo, friend or friend, friendly visits to neighboring villages often use the person who sings of love and restlessness to see the love of his youth. Additionally, the songs of prayers and hymns could also be included in the songs of introversion where the devotees sing to the, to the attributes of the gods and offer supplication to the deities. The dance songs, songs of domestic uh, occupation such as lullabies, narrative songs, and didactic 
songs could be included in the songs of extroversion. Most dance songs uh, pri uh, primarily invite the applause of the spectator, uh, songs of praises of honor of the person who has been promoted to higher uh, position in social institution, uh, songs that compares uh, dances of the beauty of the natural world. These songs seek to lift the spirit of both the participants and the audience in a uh, celebrate, celebratory uh, milieu and festivities. Songs of ble blessings or uh, for the host of the feast are more or less extroversion song, though they could address the deity of prosperity as they invite a collective benedictory refrain at the end of every song. Some ritualistic songs are narratives that, told, that tell both mythical and historical tales. They can be didactic in nature as they inform as well as teach. The song of introversion and the song of extroversion are, however, not mutually exclusive of each other. There are no doubt overlaps and recurrences between the two categories, as in uh, the case of the song of labor in uh, uh, rice pounding or weed, weed, uh, weeding songs and um, planting songs. The song could fall in both the categories when seen from two different perspectives. In terms of the content, the appeal to emotions of the listeners. However, they are also strongly social in its performativity. These songs are not sung solo, rather in group and mostly in responsive lead and follow style. Uh, more importantly, they are sung to facilitate a corporate labor. Therefore, in the traditional classification from uh, where form defines genre, they are distinctly different from songs of subjective emotion. However, an overlap is seen when the content of the song is accounted for while classifying them in a particular category. Additionally, such songs are sung in contemporary urban spaces as much uh, as part of the preservation project and reviving art form of a bygone era. Thus, they exist in a certain context. In other words, these songs could be evaluated in terms of what Laurie Honko terms as essential component of genre study, form, content, function, and textual. Uh, contextual setting. Constructing a new approach to classification of Broadway folk song is not a straightforward exercise. However, it does expand the scope to evaluate the songs as they exist in a particular context. The attempt to classify the song is based on the assumption that categories are porous and generic levels could evolve along as soci society evolves. Assessing the song in a particular social and historical context uh, shed a light on what the community perceived the meaning of the songs to be in the current time. It intrinsically uh, leaves the classification open to change and in no way provide fixity. However, the new approach is an attempt to present a new insight into the folk songs of a community that has been witnessing a rapid change in the last 100 years of their encounter with modernity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Seng Um This was, again, a very rich paper. And of course, the, the argument that we need a new method of classification is, in a way, a part of a broader argument for vernacular grounded theory, in which the theory should come from the Naga, based on the Naga experience, and not uh, come from elsewhere and be imposed, um, uh, classification or theories be imposed from the outside. I think that's a, a very important uh, um, um, Point to take. I see that there are a few questions uh, to the site, but I think we might save them for the end. But I would like to ask one quick question. As you, as you pointed out, uh, folk songs are a reflection of that time. And when the place in which they are being sung or when the activities they were associated with or the values and the norms change, folk songs are only expected to, to uh, change along. Uh, one consequence of that is the need to preserve, to record and transmit them to further generations to kind of safeguard the cultural legacy. Another way of thinking about this would also be in terms of cultural innovation. So if the times are changing, would there, is it likely that there may emerge a new trend of folk songs among the Rongme and among the Naga uh, more broadly? So what I'm trying to ask is, do you see this trend emerging or what would be the role of folk songs in the 21st century among the Naga? I think it ties up very well with the previous paper in terms of how it could be innovated, uh, you know, kind of see a new, um, new 
evolve uh, way of, for example, uh, I was, I mean, my paper is quite long, actually, I have to squeeze it down to very short for the presentation. Uh, one very um, uh, distinctively, you know, related to the labor is also, for example, rice pounding, the rhythm of the rice pounding is, uh, is important for the song, but then the, the songs are sung by people now by people who have never used the pestle and motor. And uh, instead of that, they have used the westernized drum bits, for example, or they have used a more, you know, uh, my father is, is somebody who had done the work himself. And then when he hears the song sung by young people, they are singing like a love song because the theme, the, the content is, is uh, confessional in nature. So I think um, uh, while we try to maintain uh, the so-called authentic or something that is related to the, the act of uh, rice pounding, um, I think it has to evolve and it will evolve and it is evolving. A lot of uh, Rongmei songs, especially uh, with the trend of this um, music videos that has come. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, people who are making this music video using the song of Pounding Rice, but they are they are do, uh, they are sung in a different two different setting. You know, the girl and boy are running around, uh, you know, like in Hindi cinema and things like that. And also the fact that uh, there is a confusion. There is a lot of confusion over there because uh, the the real people, the people who had actually done rice pounding and sung that song, they are not dressed like the ones we are doing as a performance because there is a confusion. You know, uh, there are clothes that are worn for labor. But then in the music video, what you see is that they are dressed like a like a, a bride or <laughs> dressed like a like a person who's going to go for a dance performance in festivals. And there's a lot of confusion happening. I think it'll take some time to kind of stream like that. But yeah, of course, as you say, it's evolving and it's emerging. But then as all changes, I think there's going to be a lot of work to be done and uh, streamlining to be done and a lot of studies to be done. So I think um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tamai. Um, let us um, move to the third presentation. Uh, this will be by um, Sajano Yamten, uh, Cesar Tis Mumbai. And the title of the paper is A Philosophy of Naga Music. Um, Sajano, please take your time. Okay. Good evening, one and all. And thank you for the time. Uh, the topic of my paper is uh, philosophy of Naka music. Uh, before I further my discussion, I would like to admit that this paper is a working paper and I am open to any kind of uh, including questions, suggestions, re uh, reading suggestions and any other uh, yeah, uh, guidance and suggestions. So yeah, and so in this paper, I attempt to bring out Naga music as one of the sources of knowledge system, an alternative way of producing Naga knowledge. Questions like why is there a need for an alternative ways of producing Naga knowledge and why Naga music will be addressed as I further my uh, discussion. Um, like the, the word Naga music is also it's supposed to be folk music, but as I am talking, it's this is part of my PhD, so it's one of my, uh, like it's a long chapter, but I will just uh, shortly say that folk music is, uh, uh, oh. if I translate the meaning of folk, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, mean anything. It doesn't mean any significance. Therefore, I chose to use Naga music instead of the colonial term folk music. So this is in short, I keep that. So along with other indigenous peoples all over the world, Naga scholarship had gone through a of epistemological injustice. Referring to such injustice, Linda Smith has expressed as, it is a history that still offends the deepest sense of our humanity. So narratives of the Nagas that stem from Eurocentric theories as well as from the early teachings of Christianity have dominated and manifested as the foundation of Naga knowledge for scholars both within the Nagas and also outside Naga scholars. The knowledge system appears to have appeals to such themes as those knowledge system appeals to such themes as modern education, 
modern religion, politics, modern history, modern aesthetics and music, wealth, and so on. The values and the knowledge system that Nagas appeals were suppressed and did not reach the global discourse due to which have shaken the very philosophy of Naga, the Nagas. To address the, such methodological issues, I bring uh, two, I will discuss two Naga music. The first Naga music that I have taken is from J.B. Mills in the Lota Naga, Lota Nagas, 1921. The other songs are borrowed from the families of composers and ladies from my village, Megukula village, one of Mukha district, Nagaland. Ideally, the, this Naga music or alternative ways of knowledge production will contribute in decolonizing narratives of the Nagas. It will I intend to contribute to the intensification of breaking free of the oppressive colonial legacy to produce consciousness of Naga philosophy or to prevent Naga philosophy from dying, which will help us to engage with humanity in the so-called modern progress. So the, uh, the first song that I will be discussing is, I, I have reinterpreted and reproduced a Lotanaga song from J.B. Mills, 1921. I'm sorry that I will not be producing PPT for these words, but I will make it as brief as possible so that it will be easy for you to understand. The translation of the song has uh, fallen short of right due to which I noticed that Mills' effort of preserving and making the musical notation of the song was nowhere utilized in any of the Lotta events or any of the musical records. The first line of the song says, Anna Echengjo Lojo, meaning the tree that I am pruning. So the tree that I, the song goes like this, the tree that I am pruning may echo hornbill perch, the tree that I am pruning may a cock mini vet perch, the tree that I am pruning may a cock king perch. Here, uh, what J.B. Mills translated was, on the tree that I am cutting. So uh, we see there is a clear difference between the word, English word pruning and cutting also. So cutting is more of a negative and pruning is, uh, pruning is an act of maintenance and it encourages encourages healthy and reproduction of fruit, leaves, and branches. So Mills' incomplete interpretation can mislead the readers on questioning the song maker or the singer, like why would a person wish or call for a bird to shelter in the tree when the tree is being cut down? To do so is a true ignorant act. So, Poor translation or incomplete interpretation of the song is a contribution to the Nakas and in particular to the Lotas image with a stigma of ignorant. Who did not know how to use the resources in the natural world? In the, I am using the exact line of Linda Smith where uh, she was referring to indigenous peoples in the New Zealand in reference with the Global North scholarships. She writes, People who did not know how to use land and resources from the natural world by lacking such virtues, we are we disqualify ourselves not just from civilization, but from humanity itself. In other words, we are not fully human. So many scholars, uh, many scholars in the colonial period, or in, even in the post-colonial, or even in the general. Uh, general people of the Nagas, we, uh, some willingly, some grudgingly confessed to such, uh, confessed and admit to such uh, accusation as not fully human. Like I can give you a lot of uh, readings on this, like how and in what way the Nagas have considered to such, to such uh, accusation as primitive, as uh, not fully human, as uncivilized. So it, and even today, such narratives are very, uh, very, uh, very popular. Like we can see those in the Facebook, in the Facebook, in other social medias, and, and even in many scholarships and literature. So yeah, and the second songs that I am going to reproduce is taken from my village. The, this song 
has no individual ownership and there are and this song is nowhere recorded except in the memory of the older people. The with all wings of flying train, we will never get a kilo of its wings. All tail of a bird called ism, we will never get a full palm of its tail. So the ism is a pretty bird. It has a thin tail as long as the body of the bird. The tail is extremely thin to tail to get a full arm. So the interpretation of the song is fluid and one can contextualize in various directions and seasons. According to the narrator 63 year old from my village, the narrator is the narrator of the song. Uh, the song is often sung and heard during post harvest festival in November, a people of older men, mostly above 60s and above, visit home to home. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I think we were experiencing some network issues, but you are audible again. Yeah, you can go ahead, you're audible again. Okay. So I will uh, continue with the... Uh, yeah. With the second example, please. Okay. Uh, uh, this so song is often sung and heard the post harvest festival called Toku Emung in November, a peer group of older men, often 60 years and above, visits home to home singing the many songs, singing many songs. However, this song is like a ritual and it is brief. Therefore, anybody can pick up and sing along. And therefore, this song is mostly known to the uh, general uh, people. The song is to encourage and calm the angst of the people, reminding them that there are things that are impossible to please the beholder's eye. One should not chase that kind of a treasure. Treasure. Sorry, light my current event. You are still audible, so you can yeah, maybe okay, I will uh, continue. Yeah. So um, I can't see my. Yeah. So this song is a reminder uh, that uh, one should not be discouraged of of the little or the more that one should not be discouraged of the harvest that they have gathered or one should not be proud of the uh, uh, harvest that they have gathered much. And there is also another illustration of the song uh, where it says that if you have to uh, gather as much as a flying termite's wing, uh, wings, or if you have to gather as much as a, a isms, one has to give that much an effort and hard work in order to gain such a uh, treasure. So the, uh, according to the narrator, the purpose of this, uh, this collective action uh, of uh, singing is uh, to wish a goodwill and also the elders desires and aspires and uh, aspires and a kind of ideal in people. It tells a kind of being or a family community or identity that elders wish to propagate to the families of the village. This 
these two songs tells us about the people far from the colonial interpretations of such as transgressors or not fully human or uncivilized, but having their own philosophy of life. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sajano, for this uh, very rich presentation, despite the technical difficulties that, uh, that you are facing. Um, I think you made a very powerful opening statement. Uh, your critique is kind of going beyond uh, the problem of cultural and linguistic uh, translation, but you call this epistemological injustice that is being done to the Naga. Now, the colonial archive is often, quite rightly so, criticized for being quite ethnocentric, as well as being couched in a social evolutionist discourse that has never really done um, uh, justice to the way Nagas have been represented. But you're taking another angle, the angle of epistemological injustice. So I would like to ask you if you could briefly restate and explain what you mean and how this injustice can be replaced or can become epistemological justice. Yeah, it's a very strong question and I might not be able to answer you in a way that you expect but uh, like epistemological uh, injustice like I have given uh, I have also used words like uh, not fully human or not or uncivilized or inferiority so this uh, the word the like the words are the words those are the words and the second is uh, those are the language and the second is the uh, the the list of anthology that has been that has been uh, lost because of the because of the uh, because of the so-called those languages those anthology list and beliefs were were called uncivilized were called uh, uh, were called not fully human. Therefore, those beliefs have been have been uh, discarded by the Nagas themselves. Therefore, I call it as an epistemological injustice. And the second question, your second question was, how do we replace those injustice with justice? Right? Yeah, to just okay. So, yes. uh, like in my like very simple answer would be by one is by decolonizing it like reinterpreting it what it actually is mm -hmm. from the perspective of uh from an insider and the next would be the next would be like uh linda smith have given a lot of uh a lot of uh suggestions and uh, in her writings like she also said that we have to unite with the global indigenous peoples in order to fight those injustice with yeah, so I think that is my simple answer to the very huge questions. Thank you, thank you. You mentioned that this is a work in progress, but I think uh, that all of us uh, present here very much look forward to see how this philosophy of Naga music will evolve. And I think we look much forward to hear more from you in the time to come. So thank you very much for this, uh, for this interesting, very interesting presentation. I'm sure there will be other questions for you uh, later on as well. But for the moment, let us move on to the final presentation for this session. This is by Nagarin um, I would like to uh, ask you to take your time. Yeah, yes, you are, you are visible and audible. Thank you. Uh, a very good evening to all. Uh, thank you so much to the uh, session organizer and the chairperson for allotting the time uh, and the time introduction and I also would like to thank MSA for giving me this platform to present uh, my paper. Uh, the paper which I'm going to present now is part of my PhD research with, uh, which I'm still working on. Uh, the, uh, the paper is titled as uh, Study on the Country Naga Culture Heritage and its artistic creativity. Uh, since we were allotted only 10 to 15 minutes, so um, my presentation will actually focus on the question of how cultural heritage and its artistic creativity in the perspective of art represent as a marker of one's identity or towards a community. Well, when we talk about the question of identity, um, 
It is not only concerned in the field of politics, economics, etc., but in the field of art to play a very significant role to define one identity as every artistic creativity has their own story to tell. In short, uh, I would argue that the Tantanaga art form is a living art. Why? Because it is largely attached and deeply rooted in their age for indigenous, traditional uh, culture, customs, tradition, uh, religious beliefs, and rituals. Uh, art and rituals beliefs among the Nagas are interdependent. None of them complete without the other. Uh, in the bygone days, every artistic creativity of the Dante Nagas was primarily associated with their day to day activities, where rituals and tattoos uh, were strictly observed in their art. Uh, any misconduct while observing the rituals were to live between ill fortunes such as famine, inter village growth, etc. Uh, Naga art in general are symbolical representation of supernatural elements and the art itself is status symbolism it speaks for a person achievement and status in the society in other words Ms. Singley, uh, i'm very yes. sorry uh, to very impolitely interrupt you but there seems to be a uh, quite a large noisy sound in the background which makes it quite difficult for us to hear you is there something close to your computer perhaps well uh, very soon, but, uh, it may have something to do with your microphone as well. Should I uh, take it off my uh, uh, microphone? Perhaps we can try that. Uh, now the sound now? Has, has. Am I audible now? Hello? You are audible, but there is a noise on the background which is interfering with your voice. I think now it's slightly better. Yes. Is yes, it has left. Okay. So um can you continue. Uh, it has returned, but we will try and we will try and listen to it. Sorry, please. Okay. So uh well uh, in other words, it expressed the narrative traditions of the tribe. Uh, so when we look into the aspects of gender presentation in the field of uh, art, men's my uh, style of art finds its expression in wood covering, pottery, and basketry, whereas women express themselves in weaving colorful textile and ornaments, etc. In short, uh, their uh, different artistic creativity also speaks of their sense of beauty and fineness. According to writers such as uh, Alan Jika, Shimre, Kanguli, remarks that the art of wood carving among the Naga is as old as their history and it has its roots in an animistic past. The carvings are considered to be primarily associated with piece of Mary, Tina Pose and dwelling uh, house or dormitory system, etc. Furthermore, when you look into the motifs and its symbolism, it is closely uh, connected to nature surrounding them and each motif speaks different symbolism which mostly revolves around the life, uh, the way of life. Some of the most important motifs being used are a lot of uh, animal motifs um, and human figures, which symbolize of a, a particular character or quality that was highly regarded in the bygone days and was uh, adorned in high relief. To name some few uh, are the Mithuns or Indian bison, which uh, symbolize as fertility, prosperity, and wealth. Secondly, women's breasts symbolize as success in love and fertility. Thus, this motifs and its symbolize, uh, symbolism shows a visual appearance of one's unique culture and indigenous life of uh, Tampu Naga. Also signifies and express its uh, artistic creativity. <clears throat> Looking further, as such, one of the many ways in which the community upholds their tradition is in the area of clothing too, where uh, it is a marker of identity and symbol even in modern times. Uh, they are one of the significant markers utilized by ethnic groups to identify their distinctiveness. Among the Nagas, it was not only the social identity of the uh, weaver, uh, which added values and meaning in the cloth, but the rareness of the materials, the amount of labor invested in the production and 
the symbolic meaning of the design motifs. Um, furthermore, traditional attire is gender among the Nagas, which is also the case in uh, Dankut society. For instance, the art of weaving is exclusively the occupation of women in Naga society, whereas for men, it is the taboo to weave a cloth. Uh, according to uh, community writers uh, such as uh, Shimei, he remarks that in the bygone days, men are not even allowed to touch the weaving materials, especially in the days when a person is observing taboo for adventure like war, hunting, uh, etc. Um, furthermore, in the past, the members of the various Naga tribes were different uh, cloths. Uh, each with specific characteristic and it was not consented within one tribe to freely wear any shawl one preferred uh, because not everyone had the privilege to wear just about uh, anything. A person had to be either born um, into privilege or bestowed, uh, bestowed upon by way of relation or earned the right to wear certain clothes. They are very much specific about the occasion of what to wear. Uh, when look into the motifs and sy symbolism of the uh, clothing, they are primarily drawn from the, from the environment as well as from the ritual life and mostly associated with uh, strength and bravery. Um, among the Tangku Naga tribes, some of the uh, five major types of popular design patterns are Kore, meaning mean, uh, design measure, uh, Hora meaning design minor, Shonku Por meaning pathway design, Jambu Por meaning Sikata design, and Rapan meaning arm of loom. Mm. Out of these five design patterns, the spearhead, uh, spearhead motif known as Hore meaning design measure is the most important motif of the Tantinaga and it's uh, found in almost all the textiles of Tantinaga. Uh, it denotes bravery and strength in men, while in women it denotes beauty and grace. Thus, uh, all this traditional knowledge is practiced for great traditional value depending on the environment um, condition. Uh, condition men has to concern with the making of utilitarian, uh, utilitarian uh, fabrics. Uh, since a long time, and also they came to discover that textile offers a good medium for expression of aesthetic genius. Uh, cloth therefore has um, symbolic meanings attached to it in identifying the gender, social status, and specific regional location of the um, wearer. So lastly, to conclude with, uh, <clears throat> uh, as a cultural heritage and as artistic creativity is the backbone of every uh, society or community as it plays a very important role in our life, as it is what keeps us also attached to our tradition, custom, beliefs, etc. Um, also, it is one of the easiest ways to identify the person's community to which he or she belongs by simply identifying the design of the textile ornaments uh, or the, um, the curving of the, curving of the uh, wood, etc. For example, the traditional coating is not only a symbol of identity, but is also considered as an important part of uh, the, uh, the community's life, as it is used in various occasions, such as marriage, festivals, um, and is also uh, presented to their case of honor to exhibit their love and respect. Um, well, in today's context, it is also necessary to give uh, awareness of cultural heritage, the, the value of artistic creativity and the ethics of its care in study curriculum and to identify tools that can develop to help communities for better understanding and um, conserve the heritage. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Nari. Um, this was the, the fourth paper, but yet again a very, very rich paper. Um, the question I, I, I have for you is the following. 
you show uh, you um, argue very convincingly about the relationship between art and morals and merit and identity and achievements. And your study, the way I understand it, is very much focused on cultural heritage. So it locates itself to a very large extent in the past, in the past. And your argument being that we have to preserve this cultural heritage uh, and transmit it further to a present day identity. Now, what you did not touch on, but I'm sure you touched on this in your wider work, is how um, cultural heritage uh, competes at time perhaps conflicts and at other times perhaps coexist with Christianity. And I would like to hear your reflections on the relationship between cultural heritage and Christianity. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, well, uh, since uh, it's an ongoing uh, research paper and then uh, due to a limitation uh, of time uh, for presenting the paper, I couldn't touch the questions which you have asked, but um, with my uh, very limited um, knowledge and uh, since it's uh, an ongoing research, so um, my uh, response might not be that satisfactory, but I would like to um, if, uh, according to my understanding, uh, I believe that, uh, as you have asked, uh, how um, cultural heritage and um, um, coming of Christianity, uh, how it identified, uh, or how it, uh, can you repeat the question again? Uh, I think that you exactly. All right. So the question is if you can uh, reflect briefly on how uh, cultural heritage, the way you are studying it, may conflict at times, uh, conflict and perhaps compete and coexist with, uh, with Christianity in the 21st century. I, I believe that um, it's not only uh, conflict with uh, Christianity, but uh, uh, as we see that uh, it's, uh, it has conflict, uh, when we look into the, um, the cultural heritage, we can also see that the, uh, the coming of uh, modernization, especially the modernization has been, we, as we all know that uh, modernization has been brought by the coming of colonizations and also um, it has a very huge impact but still then, uh, since I believe that there are, are uh, research scholars and um, like, um, I think they are uh, really working hard to um, write it into, since, since uh, we can't uh, uh, um, well, really working hard to relate, uh, uh, relate it into by writing it down in, uh, in, in well, I'm very sorry, but uh, I'm not able to construct it. Um, for the best thing which we can do is uh, to uh, write it, uh, to document it, and then since um, the past is past, but uh, as in my presentation, I mentioned that it is a living art. Why? Because uh, the um, symbolism, the design, the motifs, and all which are um, Mm, in the textile or in the wood carving, uh, it speaks about the the way of life and all. So uh, what we see is that it has been uh, put it into a written form, and then I think uh, lastly, uh, yes, uh, it's very true that the, uh, with the coming of Christianity, it has a huge impact. Like for example. Uh, mm, the uh, most important and prominent uh, uh, moral institution is no longer practiced. Uh, much of the argument was given that it is due to the coming of Christianization. Um, so I think that's what I, I, I would briefly I add. Mean, like, uh, I, I, it might not be a satisfactory response, but uh, that's what no, I would but, um... Let me follow up very, very briefly. And I do that uh, with a question which is asked by uh, Dr. Fiba Josie. She's asking whether it would be 
correct to say that the art among the Tankul and perhaps among the Naga more broadly has become secularized. In the past, it may have had religious symbolism, religious kind of meanings, but today uh, that is her question. Uh, can we say that art has become increasingly secular? Um. Uh, you have to unmute. Um, I think you're uh, muted at the moment. We, we can't hear you at the moment, so maybe let's um, pause this question and we return, uh, we return to you uh, shortly. Um, we have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, left at the moment for questions. I think um, these were four very, uh, in a way, different papers, but what they shared was that they showed on the one hand the need to preserve and transmit further the kind of traditional art and oral history. And on the other hand, they are looking at pathways in which they can be reinvented in the present and made, made relevant in the 21st century. So what I would uh, propose to do for the final 15 minutes is to open it up and um, uh, for, for the participants to ask questions. I saw one question by Shivangi. Um, Shivangi, if you are there, can you unmute and ask your question? if i'm audible uh, i just you are yes okay uh, so uh, good evening everyone i really enjoyed all the presentations uh, my i think my specific question was to sengme ma'am uh, well i was just asking if uh, you know like oral tradition like just to summarize my question i was just asking if oral tradition has uh, the capacity or the potentiality to kind of uh, challenge the hegemony of written literature because uh, that's the way uh, historiographies have been uh, theorized or uh, you know conceptualized not only in uh, Manipur but also in different parts of the world actually so I was just wondering like uh, since one of the important points that you made in your presentation was that uh, folk literature holds a lot of different essence and meanings for the communities and how the community interprets it is important so I was just wondering if the community themselves are also able to contribute to destabilizing that hegemony of written literature through how they articulate their culture and their uh, you know, emotions through folk literature. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you for the question, Shivangi. <clears throat> I think I'm going to give a kind of little winded answer because um, my presentation was on songs and I think uh, your question particularly uh, pertain to written history and oral literature in terms of, let's say, for example, myths and legends and uh, let's say migration stories and things like that. Um, I think um, just going back to the song, I think a lot of songs um, are narratives and narratives and myths are reconstructed through the songs and chants. Uh, and then from the myth, uh, the whole worldview is kind of articulated and a lot of um, let me just give you an example of uh, because I not only collect and archive uh, oral uh, material but also I look at the print culture of the particularly of wrong way people um, in that there is a, a stark difference between how um, for example the stories are uh, are available or are they are they exist in oral form and in the written form both by people of the same, you know, the, they are the same uh, wrong way people. But then what is interesting is that on, in the oral, uh, oral form, what we find is the, for example, the gods are very vicious. They are, the gods are very petty and the gods are, uh, or the legends are, uh, the heroes are not as heroic, you know. But then in the written form, what is interesting is that they are sanitized uh, in many ways and they have a particular um, 
particular motive, the particular agenda, uh, for example, uh, Zelengrong, let's say, because Roma is part of the Zelengrong, Zelengrong um, nationalism, if I may, or, or um, you know, sub-nationalism, as we call it, in all tribes, you know, trying to articulate what your identity means or who we are and things like that. So the, there, is a, there is a stark difference between how the uh, oral, what the stories exist in the oral form and written form, because there is, a, there, it has been politicized in, in, same, in, the, in a way of how there is a political agenda behind the collection and then written and then published and then disseminated to a particular targeted, you know, audience, uh, particularly, let's say, how we are different from among other Naga tribes or how and such like. So um, in terms of the hegemony, if you talk about it, it's not just uh, you know, written by other people, but within the tribe itself, uh, there is a political agenda, there is a goal, there is a nationalist uh, kind of a, uh, you know, uh, kind of a ways to shape and construct a particular identity politics, but rather in the oral form, it's more, more of a mass uh, thing. And every person would have a different uh, variation, you know, for example, you and I know the same story, you and I are same wrong way people, but then you have, your version of the story is a bit different from my version of the story because I'm a Christian and I have, I don't want to talk about the gods in that way, or I, I, I portray the gods as evil or demons or devils and things like that, rather, and you are not a Christian and you don't have any problem with these gods and their vicious way or their Im Christian morality, it doesn't fit into the Christian morality and things like that. So uh, in that way, there, it's, it's a very complex uh, uh, sort of uh, finding if you go into field work and empirically kind of discover this kind of variations and it is in itself an uh, area of study. So um, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't want to take too much time so we can discuss this in perhaps after the conference. Uh, you have my email and if you can email to me. Thank you. Thank you both for the question and for the answer. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Can I say something in regard with the question to which Abham uh, man yes, has asked? Well, uh, yes, of course. She has asked a very personal question that whether uh, uh, any inputs were taken from the scholars from the uh, institute itself or not, but um, well, in regard to, uh, to me uh, um, and to the institute, um, to the scholars and all, um, frankly speaking, uh, no inputs have been take, uh, taken from the scholars uh, in regard with the any museum and then um, a gallery. And uh, I would say that uh, the gallery is uh, in a very bad shape because um, maybe because of the, uh, the, the work is still going on and then some construction is also still going on, maybe because of that, but uh, I would say that it is in a very bad, bad shape. And the other question was related to the museum itself of uh, any, if I'm uh, in a mortis gallery, if I'm not mistaken, um, in regard with disconnected and the indigenous religion and now more seen as cultural heritage. Yes, it is very true that uh, the, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the textile or the headgears and whatever it has been uh, um, displayed. Uh, personally, I see that uh, uh, even the name, the tag, and the name pla plates which the, uh, the description has been given has been wrongly put up, which uh, I, I have found it. I don't know about the other museum, but especially the any uh, gallery, I have seen that. So, and the other, the main question is uh, the cultural heritage. So I see that um, uh, if we, uh, as a, um, if we uh, do uh, like, um, I think we have lost your voice. Ms. Singley, I think we have lost your voice. Uh, okay, um, are, there any, are there any other questions at the moment? 
then what I would like to propose in, in the interest of time, we have 10 minutes left, I would like to request each of the contributors to offer a few concluding thoughts with particular reference to the wider theme of the conference, which is Nagas in the 21st century. So the question here or the concluding uh, reflection, um, what I would like to ask you uh, to reflect on is how or what would be the implication of your particular theme, your particular argument in the 21st century. Um, can I start with Dr. Ke uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Kaisi? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, regarding the issue of the secularization, modernization, and whether it has disconnected with the indigenous religion, uh, I think as I uh, mentioned briefly in my presentation that all those traditional arts, or what is called performance arts, are now making a part of uh, the uh, what I call festival of the festival of the festivals, like the Hornbill Festival, which has become the national festival of the uh, state festival of the Nagaland, or for that matter in the south, uh, what they call uh, Lunaini and various other tribe festivals. Uh, it does not necessarily mean that uh, it has disconnected uh, with the identity, with the uh, culture, but I would say that the religious aspect of the culture is slowly, slowly uh, eroding. Though the cultural aspect is there, but the religious aspect of the culture is eroding. And it is important because when 90% or 99% of the Christian are become, uh, uh, the Nagas are become a Christian, it is becoming more and more difficult to uphold the religious aspect of the performing arts. So this is how it is becoming more of a cultural symbol. It is more of a, a cultural expression rather than a religious expression. So I won't, I won't say that it has become secularized, but I would say it has become uh, modernized. But the idea of uh, indigenous, indigeneity, it's still retained. Then uh, the whole idea of the oral tradition versus uh, the hegemony of Britain. I think that's a very good point that has come out. Uh, I mean, like uh, many a time we are carried away or we are swept away by the idea of Britain. But the fact of the matter is that oral is very much uh, exists. As in when I think we come together as a family, we always talk in oral. Or as in when we come together as a friend, we always talk in oral face to face. Though uh, or written or like any, uh, any other form of uh, communication, be it uh, print or be it electronic or be it digital that we are having today, are equally important, but at the same time, I would say is that the oral tradition continue to remain strong. And in fact, for the values or for any kind of confidential matter, for or for any kind of personal matter, what we call it as something very personal or something very intimate, we still like to convey in the form of verbal or in the form of face to face. So this is how that uh, the whole idea of oral tradition or the oral practice continue to remain strong. Maybe that is the reason why I think uh, Ong has come out what's called secondary uh, orality. Uh, I mean, what is called new orality that he has come out with in the age of the uh, uh, digital era, we have moved toward uh, what he call it as uh, uh, new orality. So this is how uh, it is continued and it is Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tamai? Uh, I just want to focus on two points. The first is uh, as a continuation from Dr. Kese. Uh, one is this um, whole idea about Naga being largely Christianized. I think uh, we need to focus also for, for that 1% or 2% of the non-Christianized uh, non -Christianized, uh, group, the minority who has not really um, 
very enthusiastically uh, took taken part in many ways in this revivalist mode, but rather they have continued from where it had been and evolved. And continue doesn't mean it was it was the same thing as it was before, but it, in in an evolved way they have continued. And that one percent, uh, the minority among Nagas, has to be given some space uh, in our discourses. That is the first point. The second point that I want to make is about the coexistence of oral and, and the print, uh, digital or otherwise, in other cinematic forms and things like that. Um, I would uh, just uh, kind of remind all of us of what Stuart Blackburn uh, talks about orality. He says that it doesn't uh, print does not in any way uh, give fixity to oral tradition, but rather it expands the scope of oral tradition. I'll give you an example. There is a, a play in my village where uh, it's a folk tale and it was written in a play form and it was performed. And the oral tradition after that, the stories of that same story that was enacted became different after that because the story, when the stories are told to the, the younger generation, to the children, a, a lot of this dramatic uh, you know, dramatic innovation was included in that oral tradition. So in any way, the print or any kind of uh, medium does not give fixity, but rather it increases and it expands the scope of oral tradition. And these are the two points that I want to leave um, the audience with, or the co-panelists with, or the chair, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Sajan. Yeah, actually, my connectivity went off. So will you repeat what you were you asking, please? All right, all right. Uh, I'm asking for your uh, concluding thoughts, especially in relation to the larger theme of this uh, conference, which is Nagas in the 21st century. So if you can relate your research to the contemporary scenario. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, what I would say is, Nagas in the 21st century, I would say, as a priori condition is in order to engage with the 21st century, the so-called development and the modern progress, the priori condition that I think, I personally think is to decolonize the narratives that are, that are out in the mainstream, in the mainstream uh, discourse. So this is, yeah, so it connects with the topic that I have discussed, so I think that that's my concluding remark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Narin, Ms. Singley. Uh, yes. Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Actually, I have some uh, problem on my screen, so it keeps on moving. So, uh... You are audible at the moment. We can, we can all hear you. Yes. Um, is it the same question or, or would you please repeat it? Yes, your concluding thoughts. Uh, your concluding yeah. thoughts on um, your research in relation to the theme of this conference. Um, the larger theme of um, the theme of the conference and um, related to my talk uh, will be like um, <clears throat> Since uh, my presentation is uh, has largely focused on the um, how cultural heritage and its artistic creativity represented as marker to one's identity, and um, as far um, uh, the international webinar um, um, theme is also titled as "Living in the Present of the uh, Naga Center." 21st century, so my, uh, I would like to say that um, since we are living in uh, presently in the 21st century and that uh, art, uh, art um, cultural heritage um, and it, uh, where it fitness and as identity is very much uh, relevant and then um, being uh, being an insider, uh, one 
needs to promote and then we can promote, and not only promote, but uh, also travel, um, um, also needs to identify the tools that can develop to help the communities for uh, a better understanding and also to conserve the heritage. Like, for example, as uh, we have seen in, in the um, pop song, like, uh, I have been uh, attending some uh, other uh, uh, presenters where they talk about the, uh, how pop music, like, for example, Hatsu Sisters, how they are promoting the uh, pop songs and all. So that is also very much relevant in this present 21st century where it is uh, promoting the cultural heritage of one's community. So in that, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, the, the four panelists. Um, I think this was an extremely enriching uh, session that, that we had. I personally learned a great deal from the presentation. And I'm sure all the participants um, I will leave this session with a uh, few important uh, uh, points to carry away. So thank you very much um, to the presenters for your time and your scholarship and your willingness to share it uh, uh, today. Um, I would also like to thank the, the participants for being here and uh, the organizers. And with these few words, I would like to um, hand the session back over to Dr. Kiditsa. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wouters, and also all the speakers. I think uh, for most of us, it was a great lesson on how to chair a session. And we have been perfectly on time. And I want to thank everyone who's attended also for making this a very engaging session. Uh, I would like to attend everyone, uh, invite everyone to attend the next set of parallel sessions, which is on health and society and religion and worldview. I'm told by the organizers that you can actually stay on. You don't need to log out because uh, the resource persons have already, I think they're already on. So those of you who are interested in attending either of the two sessions, you can stay on. All right, thank you very much. Good evening. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this I mean, like the session organizer, Casino, you know, for chairing, I mean, for organizing the session so perfectly, you know, without any kind of uh, delay. And on behalf of the NSA, would like to give a special thanks to the chairperson, uh, Dr. Yele, for very efficiently uh, chairing the session. And also would like to thank all the speakers, you know, for, you know, for, giving such a very powerful uh, perspectives on your, on the respective topic. Thank you very much. I would like to make an announcement to please stay back for the next session because we are not going to take a break. Unlike before, we will just continue in the same link. So please uh, stay back.